All right, let me invite you to turn your Bible with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1 for our final time together in this wonderful passage of Scripture, 2 Peter 1. As we conclude this very short section of knowing Christ and growing in Christ from 2 Peter, we find uh, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to conclude tonight in verse number 7. I hope that this passage has really been a help to you and you've been stirred and encouraged and challenged in your walk with Christ and that you have grown in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior this week. We're going to pick up right where we left off last night. We began last night the section. We saw that because of who we are in Christ, we are to be giving all diligence to put maximum effort into adding to our faith these virtues that Christ modeled for us on this earth, these essentials that are to be a part of the life of every professing believer in Jesus Christ. Last night, we saw that we were to add to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance. And tonight, we're going to pick up with me, look with me in verse number six. God's word says, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. The next one on our list that we are to be adding to our faith is patience. Now, this word does not mean what you need when you're sitting at a red light and you're in a hurry, <laughs> or when you're really hungry and it's taking a while to get your food. The word patience here is the word for endurance. The literal translation is to stay under, and it's actually a kind of a word picture. The idea is that a, a, a burden, a heavy burden has been placed on you. And what is our natural response when we go through a difficulty or a trial or we have a, when God places a heavy burden on our lives, what is our initial response? What do we, what do we want to do? Get it off. I don't like it. I don't want it. Get, get it off of my life. That, that is our initial response. The, the picture is this, is that God has placed it on me and instead of me trying to throw it off is I stay under it. The idea here is to endure. Now, by the way, let me just say this. This idea of endurance is this. So, so, some people have this idea of, you know, they're going through a hard time in life. They're going through a trial, whatever. And so they get the Eeyore mentality. You know what I mean? Oh, life is horrible. And God's placed his burden upon me, but it's mine to bear. So I'll go through life one day at a time. Seek okay. Look, it's not a resignation of despair. It's endurance with hope. Understanding that God is in control, that he has a purpose, that his grace is sufficient, and he is with me each step of the way. That's why James 1, 2 says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh or produces Patience, same word, endurance, but let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect or complete, mature, wanting or lacking in nothing. Here's the encouragement. If you want to take this word, patience, and put it into an exhortation form, here's what it is. Don't give in, don't give up. Endure by the grace of God. You know, some of you, are, you've gone through some hard times, and some of you are like, you know what? It's just so hard to raise your family for Jesus. It's, I, I'm facing all these battles. Why, why try? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I've been witnessing to my unsaved relatives for years. No one's gotten saved yet. <clears throat> Marriage is too hard of work. I quit. If, this is, if, what, if these are the kind of things that God's going to allow in my life, this kind of suffering, this kind of hurt, this, this kind of, of pain in my life, and me not have the answers that I want from God, I'm done. I'm out. This word challenges us, don't give in, don't give up, endure by the grace of God. Some of you are close to quitting, don't. One day, one step at a time with our Savior, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, modeled endurance for us. Remember, he, according to Hebrews chapter 12, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Jesus Christ endured for us we can endure for him. So the exhortation in our lives as believers, we are to add to our faith, patience, endurance. Number two, he says this, look with me please back at the end of verse six. He says, and to patience, godliness. The word godliness we've seen before. I told you we dig a little deeper and this is the time we'll do that. The word godliness here is the idea of God-likeness, Christ-likeness. 
And it really refers primarily to your inward relationship with who God is. Here's the problem with this word. When we think of the word godliness, too many of us have a wrong understanding of what it means. Because to us, for, for many of us, here's what godliness is. Godliness is a list of do's and don'ts, right? So, have you ever heard this? I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with girls that do. Okay. So here's the point. So here's what happens. We say, okay, here, this is godliness. Godly people do this. And so we list, give this list. They, they, um, they do this, 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 and this, whatever it may be. And they don't. For whatever reason, it seems like the don't list is more important than the do list. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, I don't. I don't look, watch, wear, listen, blah, 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 all these things, okay? And so it's this list of standards that they have that they're, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're attainable. And that is what we look to to see whether or not I'm godly. Now look, let me just say this, because somebody immediately is out there going, are you poo-pooing on standards? No. I'm not, look, as a church, you have to have standards as a measure of acceptability and to help defer to brothers and sisters in Christ and to love one another and so that everyone is on the same page as doing things decently in order. Do you know what personal standards are? You know what they're for? It's not a mark of spirituality. Standards for a, for a person are, are to be barriers to help keep us from sins that we struggle with. And that's going to be different for you and for me. So let me give you an example. My grandpa was an alcoholic. My grandpa Savinsky was an alcoholic. One of his personal standards was is he would not go to a restaurant that served alcohol. Do you want to know Why? Because he could smell the alcohol when he went into the restaurant and it would stir up that desire and he would want to go back to that alcohol, which that it absolutely dominated and almost destroyed his life. That was his personal standard. My dad, Jerry Savinsky, will go to a restaurant that serves alcohol because it doesn't bother my dad. Now, my grandpa didn't look down on my dad because he did, and my dad didn't look down on my grandpa because he didn't. That was just what my grandpa needed in his life to help keep him from sin that was dominating his life. Does that make sense to you? We're going to have personal standards that are going to be a little different from one another. But here's the problem. We begin to look and think that these are the things that make me godly, and they don't. Did you know that? You can look, watch, wear all the right things and not look, watch, wear, listen, all the right, whatever. And your life look absolutely nothing like Jesus Christ. You see, because godliness is never measured by standards, it's always measured by our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking to Him. We're going to look to Christ. For example, I've heard people say, well, you know, if you're godly, you go to church every time the door is open. Can I tell you something? You can, go, you can come to this building every time the door is open and your life look nothing like Jesus Christ. Do you know that? So instead of looking to these things, and by the way, here's what we do with our standards. We're comparative. Do you know we do that? We're comparative. We get our, our standards up here. We kind of walk along our castle wall. We're walking around. We look down. Oh, uh, their standard's lower than mine. <laughs> Liberal. I'm start walking along our castle wall, and hey, their standards higher than mine. Now what do I do? Ah, legalist! <laughs> All the time missing the entire point of what godliness is, which is to look to Christ. Look at me. Can I tell you this? Every time you get your eyes on others, you're going to get discouraged or proud. Every time you get your eyes on Jesus Christ, you are going to see areas in your life that you need to be more like him, and that's godliness. So get your eyes on Christ. Godliness is measuring your life by Christ. Lord, how do you need to make me more like Christ? Loving, caring, forgiving, humble, serving, all those things, all that Christ is, that's godliness. And we need to be diligent to add to our faith godliness. Number three, he says, look with me at the end of verse number seven, he says, and the godliness brotherly kindness. The word that's translated brotherly kindness here is the idea of brotherly love. It refers to affection for one's fellow believer in Christ. It has a highly specialized meaning in the New Testament. This Greek word is only used in context of other believers. So when he says this brotherly love, this is talking about the unique love that characterizes people who are part of the family of God. You see, look, John 1, 12, but as, re, as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the 
sons of God, even that believe on, on his name. So my dad, Jerry Savinsky, has three sons, Todd, Brent, and Scott, and my sister, Jennifer. We are all related because we have the same father. So let's go back to what we said in the beginning. Our common ground, our common, our common bond is Jesus Christ. If our faith is in the same Savior, we've trusted Christ, that means we've been born again, which means we have the same heavenly Father, the same source of life. Which you know what that means? That makes us family. Some of you just said, oh no. To you? Yeah, to me. And to him <laughs> and others. Pastor knew I was pointing at him, so he, he knew that. Here's my point. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and there is a unique love, a unique love for brothers and sisters in Christ that characterizes us as being God's children, and it's an identifying marker and factor in life of the believer. Matter of fact, do you know what the single greatest identifying mark of a child of God and true disciple of Jesus Christ is? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. That you part your hair on the same side, right? Right? No. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye love one another. One another. Brotherly love. Do you know what the problem with this is? With family is that we treat each other too much like actual family. You ever notice that? You have company comes over. Oh, no, we have company coming over. The house, spick and span, clean it up, right? Top to bottom. And we have, they're coming over. We get out the nice plates and silverware and glasses. Everything's all great. Family comes over. Yeah. Hey, why don't you grab some of those solo cups and some plastic spoons and forks? And yeah, hey, look, you know, you, you know how we are. You know the house looks like a bomb hit it. Come on in. This is life, right? And by the way, do you realize that You'll, you'll speak to your family in the way that you won't speak to a guest. You won't use that same term, that tone, or same words. You'll be sharp with your spouse or your kids. But when a guest is there, you'll be very polite and kind, right? Do you realize that as the children of God, we are to have such a unique family love? That, let me put it in this context of the local church, specifically here. If you are a child of God and a member of this church, the greatest place that you should find love understanding, forgiveness, compassion, genuine kindness, and acceptance, the single greatest place on this earth ought to be right here in this body because you are loved. And because there's a unique love in here that you're not going to find out there because you are surrounded by family. Now, there's a lot that could be said on this, but I want to deal with one of, the, one of the biggest factors in our churches that's causing fractures and fissures and divisions, and that's this. It's the unwillingness to forgive one another. Conflict. Many times over standards or preferences or decisions that were made that I don't agree with or a wrong that's been done in word or deed and grudges are held. And I want to remind you of this to kind of put it in context. Ephesians 4.32, this helps us. And be ye... Kind. Do you realize how that would change our, we just need to be kind to each other, kind in our words, kind in our actions, be intentionally and purposefully kind. Can I ask you, when you come here to this building, are you looking for opportunities to be kind in word and deed to others? Number two, kind one to another, tender hearted. That's compassionate. It means that I have a heart of compassion. I'm sensitive to the needs of others. Sometimes we become so self-focused that we don't see that people around us are hurting. And we need to come in with a heart of tenderness that is looking for the needs of others, and it moves me to connect and love them in a unique way because they're my brother or sister in Christ. But then he says, not only tender heart, he says, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If there is a brother or sister in this congregation specifically, or a brother and sister in Christ who may not even be in this congregation, who's somewhere else, or family, and you, are, and you have not forgiven them for a wrong done, you need to do that. You need to forgive because Christ has forgiven. You say, but you don't know the wrong that was done to me. No, I don't, but God does. And he's forgiven you all your sin. He says, the way you forgive others is the way that I have forgiven you. You need to forgive. Add to your faith, brotherly kindness. Can I ask you this? Are you seeking by the grace of God to put maximum, maximum effort into showing brotherly kindness, brotherly love to your family in this church? 
At the end, he says this. Our, our verse wraps up in verse number seven where he says this. And to brotherly kindness, charity. The word charity here is the Greek word agape. So this refers to the selfless, sacrificial love that's not an emotion, it's action, it's choice, and it always seeks the good or the better of another without ex expecting anything in return. That's actually why the word is translated charity. So think of it, charity is this, it's somebody who has something giving something, giving it to somebody who has nothing, who has no ability to repay or to do anything back. By the way, let me, let me just, so let's put this in the gospel context. John 3, 16, for God so loved, agape the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his, his love, his agape toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you realize that in, in the history of humanity, that the single most blatant, act of the pure, true love of God for humanity was when Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and for me and for the sins and sinners of this world. That brings us to this. That brings us to 1 John four nineteen. We agape him because he first agape us. We love him because he first loved us. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 5 tells us in verse number 3 that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. That, that phrase shed abroad literally means to be poured into. Kind of like maple syrup on your pancakes. I love maple, especially the real deal. When I was a kid, my mom made pancakes. I start pouring syrup on it, and it looked like it was in a swimming pool. <laughs> I love syrup. I can't do that anymore, but that's why I used to like it. Think of it this way. Those, it's not like how a little bit, I used to do that for my boys. I'd say, do you want mom syrup or do you want dad syrup? Mom syrup means there's a little tiny bit. Dad syrup means it's all over. Here's, here's the point. The love of God has now been poured into our life. We can love him. The only way that you and I are capable of agape love is because God first agape to love us. And then when we receive Christ by faith, that agape love was poured into our lives, into our hearts, through the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. He seals us to the day of redemption. And because we have the love of God poured into us by the Holy Ghost through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that means now we we can pour out the agape love of God to others. And we're given four commands of people we're supposed to love. We're, first of all, we're supposed to love God with all of our heart. That's the, he is to be the, our greatest object of our love as our God. Jesus in Matthew 7, when he was asked by the lawyer, what's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Love him. Number two, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Who is our neighbor? Everyone else. Not only that, we're to actually the word of God does command us in other texts, we are to agape our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes the word phileo is used, the idea of brotherly love. Sometimes it's agape love. Matter of fact, um, 1 Peter challenges us, 1 Peter 1, see that you love agape one another with a sincere heart, fervently. So the word sincere means it's unhypocritical. And the word fervent is the idea, it was a word that was used to describe a person who was completely physically spent. Have you ever seen one of those Olympic sprinters who just like flies down the track 200 meters and they're, at the end they just collapse? Or maybe the guy who's run the really long distance and they've just totally exerted themselves to where, they're, where they fall down at the end and just lay on the ground heaving. That's how you're to love one another. The agape love that we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ with. Not only that, so we're to love God, we're to love our neighbor, we're to love the brothers and sisters in Christ with agape love, but there's one more category. Our enemies. That's hard, isn't it? And he says... You are to add to your faith love. You say, what does that look like? I'll just encourage you, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. No, don't turn there right now. <laughs> I don't mean that. Go to, 1, go to 1 Corinthians 13 and read through 1 Corinthians 13. And what you will see is this. You will see what agape is and you'll see what agape is not. And you will realize when you read that, when you see love, charity is, love is, remember that that's God's love. 
and that now you, because you are born again and the love of God has, poured, has been shed abroad in your hearts, you now have the capacity and the ability to love others with the same love that you have been loved with by God, which means you can, by God's grace, you can live a life of love that looks like 1 Corinthians 13. A love that is kind, it's not envious, it's not proud, it doesn't vaunt itself, it's not easily provoked, it doesn't think it's evil, hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. You can live that kind of love. And God's word says we are to be diligent to put maximum effort into adding to our faith love. As our time in God's word ends this evening, I want to ask you this evening of these four more things that God's word has said. And by the way, can I just remind you, this isn't options. This is for all believers need to have all of these things in our lives because these show the authenticity of our relationship with Christ. So which of these things has the Lord brought to your mind? Do you need to add to your faith? Maybe you need to, maybe you're struggling with patience, endurance. You say, that's me. It's been so hard. I've been so tempted to quit on God. I've been so tempted to give in, to give up. Can I encourage you? Don't give in. Don't give up. Endure by the grace of God. Maybe it's godliness. Maybe you have found that you have, your focus has really been on all these lists of do's and don'ts that you have done, and you, and you feel like I'm a godly person because of all these things I don't do, when maybe the reality is you just need to get your eyes off of those things, and you need to come and look at Christ and get your eyes on him and realize how you need to change to be like him. That's true godliness. Maybe you need to add to your faith. Maybe the Lord really got a hold of your heart about brotherly kindness and you just kind of realized, you know, I, I haven't really been treating my, my brothers and sisters in Christ like the family that we're supposed to be. Maybe God spoke to you about being more kind or intentional in, in meeting needs or being more sensitive to the needs of others. Maybe God got a hold of your heart about forgiveness. Maybe there's someone here tonight that there is a conflict between you, a resentment, against someone that you've not reconciled, can I encourage you, do that even tonight before you leave. Maybe it was agape love. Maybe the Spirit of God took that truth and pointed out some areas in your life that you need to be adding love, this agape love towards God, towards your neighbor, towards brothers and sisters in Christ, towards your enemies. And you need a life that lives out the love that's, that's kind of explained and exhorted to us in 1 Corinthians 13 to live out that kind of love. Whatever your need, God's ready to meet that need. All you need to live out this life, he's already said, everything that pertains to life and godliness has already been given you through the knowledge of him that called you to glory and virtue. And it's in knowing Christ that you will find the grace and going to Christ for the mercy and the grace that you need that you can, you can add these things to your faith so that your life looks like Christ. So would you join me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed this evening. Let's spend some time reflecting and responding to this truth, asking God to help us to add these things to our life so that our life will reflect our relationship with him.